I'm Amey. I'm a machine learning tech lead at Meta, and I'll be talking about navigating the landscape of bias in recommender systems. Um, this talk will be a very high-level overview of the issues of bias in recommender systems and some techniques to debias these systems. Uh, feel free to connect with me on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter if you want to discuss more offline. So, okay. Uh, so we'll uh, introduce. This is the agenda of the talk. We'll introduce recommender systems first. Uh, then we'll talk about factors of biases uh, in this system. Uh, we'll talk about deep biasing, data collection, and model training. Then how do we promote fairness in recommender system results? And finally, uh, tying it all up to how do we break the feedback loop? Uh, and then some exciting future direction and open areas in this uh, field. So uh, users go to recommender systems for a variety of their needs and tasks. So on the right, you can see a snapshot of some of the online recommender systems uh, that are there today. Um, users go to them for a variety of reasons. For example, searching for information, finding entertaining content, uh, purchasing products, staying up to date with trends, and uh, even saving time on some decision making, etc. The goal of the recommender system is to leverage user and item uh, information, such as past preferences of the users, item attributes, user demographics, and so on, to build appropriate representations for these users and items on the platform to then generalize, uh, to then generate personalized recommendations for these users and rank these recommendations to fulfill their needs. Uh, finally, when we recommend it, presented to the user, users interact with them in various ways. For example, watch a video, uh, send a message, like, uh, comment, and so on. And these fine-grained interactions are then logged and then uh, looped in back to training data to improve the system further. And we also need to identify user satisfaction and optimize for it to evaluate such recommender systems. So we have to develop some success metrics uh, and so on using the above criteria. Next, we'll look into uh, some factors of where biases come into recommender systems. So they are inherent in most recommender systems and they have like real world consequences. So they produce suboptimal results for the users they reinforce existing inequalities, and they also limit opportunities for exploration and discovery by uh, overemphasizing already what is popular and stuff like that. So there are multiple factors of uh, bias and recommender systems. The first one is the user interactions data is observational rather than experimental. So this means that the data influence data is influenced by both what actually is shown to the user and also what users choose to rate. Secondly, items are not evenly present in training data. So popular items or even like users who are more popular, um, uh, you know, give more interactions and items that are more popular receive more interactions. And then they are more present uh, in the in model, in the model data, and they influence the model training much more. And thirdly, uh, the feedback loop intensifies such bias over time. So exposure mechanism actually, you know, decides what items are exposed to the user and then interactions on these items are then circled back again in training data. So these biases are reinforced due to the feedback loop. So the first part is how do we debias our data collection and, and a lot of biases due to the, the way the data is collected. So the first type of bias we'll see is selection bias. So this occurs because users choose which items to rate. And so observed ratings are not a representative sample of all the ratings. So you can see two charts there. On the left chart is the rating probability per uh, on, on randomly selected items. So you can see like most of the items have rating one and very low, less number of items have rating five. On the right side, you'll see the graph of rating probability on user selected items. So there are a few things that are very clear here. The first one is users tend to select and rate items that they like. So this is evident from the uh, rating of, uh, you know, the, the rating five, the probability increases much more from the left to the right chart. The second one is users are more likely to rate particularly good or particularly bad items. So 
And from the second chart, you can see that rating 1 and rating 5 have very high probability. And if you just train a model directly on this data, you will learn uh, these skewed patterns in your model. And this leads to also inferior performance of the model. So to debias uh, this selection bias, there are multiple approaches. The first one is joint generative model training, where you model two things jointly. The first one is rating prediction task, where you predict what rating will the user give to the item. And the second task is missing data prediction task, where you predict which items the user will rate, and both these are learned jointly. So th this is very explainable. Uh, so that's the advantage of this approach. While the challenges are, th there is some, uh, you know, assumption in data, the, how you create the data. You are assuming that the probability of users selecting the items depending depends on what ratings they would give. So that assumption may not be true always. And it's a complex model that is hard to train. Next approach is data imputation where you impute the missing entries with pseudo labels such that the observed data is close to the ideal distribution. Again, this is simple to understand, but it's very highly sensitive to how you uh, label, like how you create those pseudo labels. And mostly these labels are set in a very heuristic manner. So that's a challenge here. The next approach is propensity scoring, where you can you basically have the propensity of what is the likelihood that the user will rate this item and then you can use inverse of this score to kind of debias the estimator um, by using it in the training. Again, this is a, this is a easy to understand theoretically sound approach, but these approaches generally have high variance and it requires setting these propensity scores accurately, which is difficult. The next type of bias is conformity bias, where users generally tend to conform to group behavior and then the feedback of the, the users do not accurately represent their two preferences. So if, example of this is if a video is presented to a user which has a high number of views, users generally are curious to understand why it has a high number of views and they may view the video to understand that, uh, but that video may not be really uh, up to their interest or matching to their interests. So here user ratings are skewed by social influence and they may differ like the ratings of the users may differ before or after they are uh, exposed to these public opinions. And again model trained on this observed data captures these spurious okay, associations. So to mitigate conformity bias one of the approaches incorporating social factors where we model the user rating as a linear combination of the pure preference based estimation and the public opinion influence. The next approach is enforcing disentanglement. So here the idea is you have the user interaction tasks that you're trying to predict on, on shown in the right side here. So for example, you're trying to predict uh, click uh, so along with the click loss, you train two other losses, which is the conformity loss and interest loss from the training data. And you have the interest and conformity embedding uh, learned with, with the click loss together in the model. So here you're trying to separate out, you add additional supervision to separate out these two embeddings from each other. So you're trying to disentangle this. And uh, the way this is done is basically you can maximize the distance between the conformity embedding and the interest embedding by adding the supervision. So this and en this enforces uh, disentanglement and learns uh, conformity components and interest components. Um, the next type of bias is exposure bias, and this occurs because most of the users are. Uh, exposed to only certain items, so only certain items in the uh, entire item repository is explored. So when you have unobserved interactions, that don't necessarily mean negative preference. So for example, in most recommender systems, user dislikes are not available because most most of them capture implicit feedback. So if you watch a video, it is counted as a positive. 
but uh, there is no difference between not watching a shown video versus not being shown a video like both are kind of negatives so separating out these real negative interactions that is when you are exposed but you don't uh, when you are not interested this is uh, this is indistinguishable from a uh, potentially positive ones where you are not even exposed to the recommendation so user and item features basically influence exposure and uh, thus they distort the interactions probability to ensure fair exposure there are a few techniques one is heuristic weighting and sampling where you down sample the observed data heuristically or you use uh basically you remove them from the training data somehow and the weights to do the sampling can be based on either user activity or item popularity or network information and so on this is simple but again here similar challenges arise where setting the weights is done either it needs human expertise or it's done using like grid search to optimize for the system which is a challenge and the weights are often coarse grained so it is set on either a item cohort or a user cohort and not personalized per uh, per training data row and so it's not very flexible the next method to uh, ensure fair exposure is a causality based approach where we are trying to answer the counterfactual question would the user interact with the item if they had seen the item so this helps remove uh, spurious associations by eliminating the direct causal effect of exposure fe features on the model prediction and this is uh, very explainable but it requires again assumptions on data generation which is a challenge here the next type of bias selection bias is position bias where users uh, tend to interact more with items on top of their feed rather than at the bottom even though things at the bottom may be uh, of their interest and that's due to various factors um fatigue user fatigue is also shown to be one of the factor due to which as you go down you are less likely to interact with something lower so position uh, basically affects uh, outcomes in like many ways so first one is it impacts item exposures so something at the bottom of your feed you may not even like look at it and secondly it hinders user judgment that is due to fatigue and stuff so as you go lower you are like less interested in and in looking more so to overcome this uh, this approach was proposed by youtube a few years ago which is position aware ranking so there you factorize the prediction into two components so the big box on the left side is the main tower which is capturing the relevance component on the right side the, uh, there is a shallow tower which is capturing the position bias components so the final prediction is basically like a uh, combination of these two um and like uh, one thing to note here is like position cannot be directly used in the model for training because it's not available during inference stage the position is um, you get the position after ranking so uh, in the shallow tower uh, we add features that contribute to position bias for example the position itself uh, interface also like because interface determines how many positions are visible to the user and so on and position here is used with dropout so that it doesn't like over like its effect is not too much on the final prediction the next um, we'll look next into model training and debiasing that so in model training a popular type of bias is known as inductive bias where we make assumptions on the model to learn the target function better and so we intentfully add biases into it so th this shows that biases are not always harmful and uh, types of biases we add here are you know some assumptions on the nature of the target data for example you could sample difficult negatives even more so that the model learns faster or or better and uh, for example in key nearest neighbors the majority class in the immediate neighborhood is set as the uh, it's used to guess the class of the unknown label next we'll look into uh, how to promote fairness and results so taking a step back like what exactly is unfairness in results 
So it's systematic and unfair discrimination against an individual or a group of individuals uh, which are underrepresented in the data in favor of some others. So we know that you know models are very highly likely to capture uh, things that are more um, or overrepresented in the data. So these groups uh, or individuals are uh, you know favored more and they are reinforced again due to the feedback loop as we mentioned. So they they are reinforced in ranking. Uh, example here is like uh, it was shown in the 2019 paper that gender imbalance in job recommendations could lead to a woman having less visibility to high paying jobs. So one of the sources of uh, unfairness is popularity bias, where you keep over recommending popular items that make them even more popular and then this like goes, goes on reinforcing the same loop. It reduces the fairness by making popular items more visible and it also reduces personalization and serendipity of recommendations because you keep seeing the same things over and over. Uh, it also hurts users who favor niche items. So this is uh, this is a very common case across many recommender systems where we have a very small set of items that get the most distribution and most of the items get a very low distribution. So most of the recommender systems, online ones, are have this long tail uh, problem. To eliminate popularity effect, uh, one of the approaches is using uh, causal graphs in the model. So in this model on the right side, you can see it has three components. The middle component is a user item component where you train it on both user and item features. On the left side, there is a user only component and on the right side, there is an item only component. And the final prediction is a composition of all these three components. So on the left side, the output there is controlling what is the influence of user engagement. On the right side, uh, you're in you're kind of counting what is the influence from the item popularity. So in this case, for example, if you are predicting for a very inactive user or for a very uh, unpopular item, then the user item matching is used. Um, and the effect of user item item matching is more. So when you don't know much about the item or the user, you kind of focus more on the user item matching. There are a few other strategies that have been uh, worked around here where you could re-rank the results by boosting the prediction score of uh, lesser popular items. But uh, this is again tricky. You need to consider users' tolerance for less popular items to prevent recommendations that may not be of interest to them. Uh, also, inverse propensity scoring is used here to decrease the influence of very popular items in training data by giving it an inverse uh, score of the popularity. So, uh, you know, there are these famous fairness formulations that have been come up, uh, that have been developed uh, in the industry and especially in recommender systems. So, one is like fairness through unawareness. So, here you say that you're not using any sensitive attributes in the model training. So your model could like is is guaranteed to be fair because you're not using any sensitive attributes. The next one is individual fairness, where you say that you have similar predictions for similar individuals, and your similar means some some metric of similarity is used. Then there is demographic parity, which means you are having equal positive prediction rates for each of the sensitive or protected group. And finally, equality of opportunity, which is you have the same likelihood of being in the positive class for each of the protected group. So each of the protected group has equal positive rates and hence you are kind of, it, it's a proxy for fairness. So uh, promoting fairness, the first method is rebalancing. So here you kind of rebalance your training data or recommendation results with respect to some fairness criteria. And uh, the ways to do it is either relabel the training data or resample it. Um, again, this is straightforward, but it possibly hurts accuracy because. The next method is regularization, where you formulate the fairness criteria as a regularizer. 
and you basically enforce the independence between what is the user viewpoint and what is the rating uh, via a penalty term. So an example of a fairness regularizer can be using the negative mutual information between the sensitive attribute and the prediction to uh, kind of make the, make the recommendation system fair. Next approach is adversarial learning, where you play a min-max scheme between a prediction model and an adversary model. So here the idea is the adversary tries to predict the sensitive attributes from the data uh, representation and you minimize the adversary's performance. So minimizing the adversary's performance means it is not able to identify sensitive attributes from the representation. That means your now representation is fair. So tying it up all together, like and the next concept is on breaking the feedback loop. I think this is, uh, we, we've seen here, like, you know, we have various types of biases in data that causes data imbalance. Uh, and then further, it causes a bias in the results, which are then reinforced. So that that is the problem here. Uh, this also shows up as popular items being even more popular and decreasing diversity. Like this is the eco chambers or the fil filter bubble problem that is commonly known. To break this, one approach is using uniform data. So you have, you show randomized results to the user and then based on what user engage with, use that data to train your model further. Uh, but the challenge here is that, you know, these re randomized results first hurt user experience and platform metrics. So they are mostly like very difficult to uh, accumulate the next approach is reinforcement learning, where you balance explore and exploit to maximize long-term user satisfaction. So uh, re reinforcement learning is basically like a sequential interaction problem between a RL agent and users, where a RL agent tries to update the strategies based on user feedback and users try to provide feedback on, on these recommendations that are provided by the RL agent. And sequentially they kind of keep improving the system so this approach is harder to train rl models are harder to train especially in, in large scale production systems and their off policy evaluation is very challenging so you need to kind of uh, you know evaluate them online uh, always there are many future like exciting future works here in this field going on so first one is a lot of work going on in identifying unfairness issues like defining fairness criteria, designing uh, these fairness uh, fair systems or fair uh, fairness aware algorithms to balance accuracy and fairness. This is a very active area of research. Uh, recommender systems need a general debiasing framework to handle multiple biases simultaneously. As you've seen, like there are multiple types of bias. Most of the work done is to address each type of bias individually. Uh, right now, there is no like good system to handle multiple biases simultaneously and this is a largely unexplored area. Benchmark data sets and standard metrics are needed for unbiased recommender systems uh, evaluation so that all these systems could be evaluated on these uh, and compared against each other. Also the double-edged uh, nature of uh, biases in recommendation systems need further exploration. Like as we mentioned, some of the biases are a good biases to help learn the model better. So how do we like leverage these benign, benign biases and then circumvent the harmful ones that needs uh, much more exploration to improve performance? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, for the talk. It was uh, really eye-opening in some sense. So um, you kind of hinted this in the future work section, but about the metrics and uh, different evaluation uh, procedures to assess bias. So what are you guys doing as of now? Um, how does the evaluation loop work? Um, and how do you decide like which model gets into production um, based on different performance on different biases? Yeah, I think um, I cannot go into too much details, but uh, you know, we have a lot of like, um, we look into like a lot of calibrations across uh, different uh, data sets. We also have, uh, you know, all like we have multiple evaluations. I cannot go into a lot of details, but I think a popular one is just looking into calibrations and uh, how your system is like doing on, on different groups of users. Hi. 
So I'm intrigued by your description of how to deal with fairness metrics in the context of recommendations. I wonder if you can comment on the uh, the impact this has on business metrics, business outcomes such as utilization of of your app and like time spent on the feed in addition to just the desirable outcome of a more fair uh, result for the user? Yeah, I think um, that's a good question right now. Uh, I mean, we've seen like there are a lot of books that have shown that having a fair system leads to a better system. Like most of these recommender systems nowadays are like a multi-stakeholder marketplaces where you need to care about the user, but you also need to care about the content creator and stuff. So if you kind of show keep showing popular content um, maybe you will get user engagement but content creator will not be very happy because only a very few content creators get most of the, the most of the distribution so balancing this out generally we have seen it's better for the whole ecosystem um, and generally improves the whole ecosystem thank you for the great presentation I know you show some fairness metrics and I was curious of how do you manage the trade-offs between group fairness and individual fairness? So you said, for instance, you could have group parity where different groups have the same outcomes, but then if the individuals in those groups are different, then you don't have that individual equity versus you could have individual equity, but then the group's outcomes would be different. Does that make sense? So how will you account for those trade-offs? Yeah, I think um, individual ones are generally like even more difficult to measure. So what we try to do is, you know, general approach is trying to break it into like different segments um, uh, appropriately and do like different. So you're not looking at one or two, like you're not looking into groups along a particular dimension, but you have groups along multiple dimensions. So many of the groups are also overlapping by making sure that all of them are fair, kind of it's a proxy. But yeah, individual fairness is not super easy to measure. Hey, that was really interesting. My question relates to your taxonomy of bias, the different kinds of bias you talk about. When I think about recommender systems, I often think about my dad and recommending him music to listen to. There are certain categories that he's really particular about, and so he will dislike things that are very similar to one another from an objective point of view. Like, he loves Deep Purple, but he hates Led Zeppelin, right? So, and it could be the other, right? So he was like, he picked one side versus another. But it'd be, there'll be other things where it's more linear. He'll like everything in that category or whatever. Is that a kind of bias that fits in the taxonomy you mentioned anywhere, the kind of that you shape maybe, that I'm suggesting? Or uh, is that an emergent property of something else. Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying may be related to exploration. So we have a lot of systems on having some form of exploration. So we, in that, we also take care, like, you know, what uh, some users do like exploration. Some users do not like exploration at all. They're like, oh, I know what I want to watch. And I just want to get this, uh, you know, I just want to watch this, but other users are more open to like uh, exploratory content. So I think that is also another factor that is used to, uh, you know, in, in the recommender system that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.